Centerfold is one of a handful of annual origami conventions in North America. The next will be August 9th through the 11th, 2019. Everyone is welcome at Centerfold, beginner to expert. Really, not kidding. People are afraid to come because they think they will not fit in. This is the most welcoming, friendly group of people you will ever meet. This three-day convention is held in Columbus, Ohio every August and includes a huge exhibit of origami. 80 plus origami classes ranging from beginner to super complex and a few special workshops like the one in this video. This workshop is on back coating paper and using methyl cellulose to enhance the characteristics of your paper to allow more advanced folding. If you are even a high intermediate to advanced folder and you do not know what the previous statement means, then you really do need to watch this video. Back coating is an inexpensive and easy and yet is almost unknown even amongst the advanced folders. If you are interested in attending future centerfold conventions, please send an email to origami at ohiopaperfolders.com. We will only use this to notify you when the registration is online for 2019. heirloom pieces. Uh, almost all of the uh, back coating we do is in large batches. I actually saved all of the patio glass from my house which is now 33 years old so the patio doors all needed to be replaced in the last couple of years and I probably have at least a dozen sheets of patio glass. It's my tempered. patio glass and what are the dimensions of those pieces? They're about 34 by 70 inches, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and when I want to make six foot paper and cooch that onto glass, I actually use clear shipping tape to take two big sheets of glass and I have a, a four foot by eight foot PVC table so nothing sticks to it. And uh, when Michael and I make uh, a duo paper for like going to the New York Convention or some other big group, um, we often uh, make, let's see, two, four, six sheets of duo yes. and we usually do at least four or five sheets of glass at a time so there are many ways to make duo paper but that's what we do when we're making a lot so it's air dried which is what you'll have today and um, the one thing I want to mention about back coating is uh, get help because it often takes four hands to you know one hand on each corner to grab the paper when it's wet and to carefully place it on top of the gooey uh, sheet that's already um, uh, applied to the board. Um, I guess I should back up and say, well, why do we want to back coat paper? Well, there's several reasons. One is, uh, if you want two colors, just put two different colored sheets together. If you want to impart more structure to the model when it's dry, this methyl cellulose that we'll be using, or MC, as people call it in the, in the, in the field, um, hardens up when it's dry and it's reversible so every time you moisten it it softens up again and uh, the piece that you fold will be more easily shaped with MC in it uh, when you have at least two layers of paper with MC in between it has what we call the plywood effect which means the sheets can slip when the MC is wet and then when you've changed the shape 
and allowed it to dry, it's going to retain in that position, which is why in our origami jewelry book, everything in that book is back coated. Nothing is sprayed with goop on the outside. All of the goop, as it were, is in between the layers of paper. And that allows us to use fancy papers from paper source, Italian wrapping paper, and really neat Japanese washi. So stiffness in the final form, more structure, and that plywood effect allows you to make laminates of three, four, five sheets with different qualities. You can put hemp inside, cotton on the outside if you want the fuzz there, but you don't want the, uh, you know, the weakness of cotton compared to the hemp. And then I'm going to let Michael take it over from here to several other uh, uh, points, but you know, why should I talk? Well, no, no, this is great. Richard covered a lot of important points, because why would we do it in the first place? When the origami community first became acquainted with Richard and me, um, one of the most common questions was, why do you make your own paper? And it almost sounded like we were crazy. You know, why would you go through the, to the trouble? Well, I would often walk into a paper shop that may have 800 different kinds of papers, handmade and machine from all around the world. I'd walk out empty-handed. I want that color, but it's too thick. I need that square area, that's too small. I want that texture, you know, everything I needed was not in one sheet. It was a compromise. It was a compromise, and it actually even started earlier than that because I started teaching myself to make my own paper when I was 16 years old. I would walk into the paper shops, and it was a little bit of a different situation. I said, oh, I'd really love to have that paper, but I can't afford it. <laughs> so um, we, I lived in a paper making town, paper mill town, as I made my machine. And it was quick uh, and easy for me to learn the ways of just making paper. And so I started at it. And I was motivated to have better quality papers because of the example of the work of Akira Yoshizawa. Those of you who have never heard of Akira Yoshizawa, I don't want to give you his life history, but um, you know, he's really the father of an awful lot of what we do today. The example of his work, I had never seen work like that before. This touch, this artist's touch was in everything he did. And obviously, the paper was exceeding to his demands. Whatever he could do was not just because he was a fine, great artist, but he had the correct materials. A little bit of reading brought me to the point in the fact that he lived in Japan and he had access to some of the greatest hand paper makers of the world. And I couldn't afford that paper either. So I started making my own. Now this gets into the wet folding thing. Many of us will do back coating because we want to use the paper for wet folding. I came upon wet folding as a, by accident. I was making my own paper, pressing and drying it. The first batches, I was a bit anxious so I was taking the paper out when it was, you know, set, dry enough to fold, but there was definitely some moisture in there. And I would fold this handmade paper, and the slight trace of moisture in there allowed me to shape the paper in the style of Yoshizawa. And then when it dried, it hardened up. I brought my first samples of my work uh, to New York City on a trip to visit Lillian Oppenheimer at the, well, as it was then known, the Origami Center of America. And when she saw my work, she said, you wet your paper. I was so embarrassed because I thought I was cheating. Because after I learned that trick with the, oh, the paper, when it's wet, I can do this, I started wetting my paper when I was doing my folding to make my work. She saw that right away, and I thought, it's like, a, aha, I caught you. But then she said, Yoshizawa does that. And then I said, uh, not like that, but you know, and suddenly things gel. You say, of course he does. Then she added something that I didn't know. She said, and he pastes his papers together. He learned that because he was trained as a calligrapher in Japan. And after they do their calligraphy on that soft washi, she always used that word washi. It's soft like cloth, you know, she said. They can't mount that on scrolls that way. So the, the, these, um, uh, uh, you know, these shodo artists, they, they paste their artwork to other papers to make them stiff. And Yoshizawa does that too. And he uses ordinary wheat starch paste. So that started it. I went home and I started boiling up wheat starch and pasting my papers together. I would use ordinary brown wrapping paper. These pasted together papers were transformed. They were amazing. Really rigid when dry. 
and then you could moisten them, and they would fold beautifully, and then they'd harden up. You know, Lillian had some of Yoshizawa's pieces in her collection, and I got to handle them, and they were, they were hard like pieces of wood. And they were obviously folded from papers that were much stiffer, I mean, much thicker than one would expect you could use in origami. And it was that wetting, that thick paper that allowed it to be folded. Now, another important thing that Lillian told me on that visit that helped me with my back coating. So remember, I didn't know about pasting papers together uh, for origami or for anything until I would, had this little encounter. She said, so he would use the wheat starch paste and he'd brush it on one piece and he'd put, put the other one over. She said, but he pastes it all around the edge on a piece of wood, on a wooden board, so that it dries flat and straight. I got all of that information from that little encounter with the, you wet your paper. <laughs> if I hadn't have done that, she probably wouldn't have talked about this. But anyway, I went home and started doing the wheat starch paste. And my dad, who uh, was a contractor and knew a lot about wallpaper paste and everything, you know, he watched me making this stuff. He said, what are you making that kind of paste for? Nobody uses that anymore. He said, use methyl cellulose which back then you could buy to put up wallpaper. So I bought boxes of methyl cellulose and started using that. No more boiling. Back then it was a fairly new product. Yep, it was. And wheat starch is food for bugs and molds. It's delicious. How many of you ate yeah. paste in kindergarten? <laughs> yeah. Did you know there's toluene yeah. in that? But they, they flavor it. Oh, well. Yeah, and toluene. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'm going to cut this a little short. I'm not giving you my life story here, but I just wanted for you to see how um, uh, the example of one person's art, just a photograph of it, can send another person from another side of the world down this amazing journey. And I can't even imagine what my life would be like without that. So back when I was in elementary school, they had yeah. something called the Invisible Man yeah. and the Invisible Woman, so you could see where yeah. the guts yeah. were and everything. Yeah. I brought you the Invisible Back Coder <laughs> because I wanted to show you, as Michael mentioned, uh, that Yoshizawa pasted his paper to a board. Yeah. You have two different sizes of paper. Mm -hmm. Now, one of them uh, will be the bottom sheet, and that's the smaller one. Here it's either yellow or green, yeah. depending on how colorblind you are. And then the larger sheet is actually what's on top. And the MC will be applied um, after the wet yellow sheet is put on the hard surface, and the MC will like uh, drop up. We're going to kill each other yet with you motioning at me too. The MC will be applied to the surface of the yellow, and it will go off onto the edge of the plastic or your whiteboard. What are these made of, John? Uh, it's uh, just like the whiteboard in a. Uh, it's like a mason. It's a, it's, it's it's actually a, a elementary school grade school. Uh, whiteboard. So is it a polyester coating? Uh, yeah, it's just a fiber board with a, a plastic coating it's really on it. Cool. It's very I got up at, um, at 3.30 in the morning to try it, and I've got one here that's dry, so we'll be able to see how it pops off, and you guys will be able to yeah. do that yeah. like later tonight. But anyway, you see this little piece of blue paper here? That's called a gate. Any of you that know injection molding know that the gate is where you actually insert the plastic into the mold. But this is where we insert the knife so that I can go around and separate that glued strip so the paper is only being retained by the margin. All right? Does that all make sense to everybody?